Collection Week. And if you brought yours back today, packed and ready to make a child smile, thank you. And if you're like me and you had them set out on the table near the door so that you could bring them into church this morning and forgot, well, we've got some grace. Or if you've still got a couple of items to pack up yet and you can drop them off here, they just need to be at the church before noon on Wednesday as this is collection week. Next week is Discipleship Sunday where we're welcoming new members and celebrating a few baptisms. Talk to Deb Toth if that's something that you would like to be part of. And in just a few weeks, on Sunday, December 9th, we're going to have our vision dinner and talk about what we're going to be doing at LSA for 2024. It's kind of like potluck with a purpose. You get dinner out and you'll find out what we've got planned next year. So check online, you're going to be able to register for this very soon. And if you'd like to stand now, or for more information on anything that we do, you can check out our website, lsa.church, or connect with us in the lobby after service. So now, let's stand together as we enter into a time of worship. Welcome, LSA. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it and help us rejoice.
turn to you in thanks and praise for your faithfulness. Lord, when we feel alone, you're there. When we feel scared, you're there. When we're not well, your hands are on us. You've always been faithful. Teach us and guide us, Lord, to also be faithful to you. Lord, that our eyes would always be focused on you and your will for our lives. Father, I am so grateful for this church family, for this family, this church family, Lord, that supports one another, that prays for one another, and they're there for one another. I ask that you just bless this family this week. Bless our service today. Your hand upon Pastor Brian as he speaks. We pray that the offering that is received today, Lord, that you would just use that. Lord, that our faithful giving would be used to make changes in lives, changes in our community. Can we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and for being here. Please accept our worship and praise as an offering to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, the Son of God, he was a man of unconditional love and compassion who has a message for us all. From the Sermon on the Mount to his parables, Jesus' teachings are timeless and powerful. He taught us to love our enemies and to turn the other cheek. He taught us to be generous and forgiving, to always seek justice and to be humble. He preached that the greatest commandment is to love God and love our neighbor. He showed us that we can make a difference in the world by following his example. Jesus also said some difficult things. He said that it is hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven and that those who follow him must take up their cross and deny themselves. He warned us of the consequences of not following his teachings. Follow Jesus. Be inspired no matter what the season of life you're in. Make a difference in the world by following his example. May we be filled with love, hope, and inspiration while we follow Jesus. Good morning. It's so good to gather together and to sing praises to God. I look forward to it every single week, and this week was no exception. I don't know about you, but we had, uh, there's been some big changes around the church, and there's been a lot of changes and challenges in people's lives over the last week. I don't know about you, but it seemed like everybody, there were health challenges, there were um, just difficulties at work, or there's a lot of things going on. And, and the one great thing is we know we can recenter ourselves on Sunday and remind ourselves that God is, as, uh, as Wendy said, faithful. And he has never left us. He will never forsake us. He is always with us through the highs and through the lows. He is ready to carry us. He is ready to celebrate with us. Uh, and we just need to turn to him at any point. And that's why we, uh, one of the reasons we come on Sunday is to remind ourselves of that fact. Now we just got to be able to carry that with us through the week. So I said there was lots going on. And one of the lots of things going on is that we, had a, uh, we have a candidate uh, for family ministries pastor that is present with us today. Um, she, her name is Lisa. Uh, I won't try to pronounce her last name um, because uh, she's Ukrainian and that Ukrainian last name is not one that I can easily say. And so I won't even try. But uh, Lisa is here. She's walking around with Deb. If you've got any of your family in uh family ministries, anything between the ages of zero and 25, and you want to talk with her, right after the service, you want to find Deb and then meet Lisa and talk with her for just a little bit. I would love your feedback. So we, this is, as I said, is a candidate. 
and I've been having uh, Lisa meet everyone that I can, and then I'm gathering your feedback. I think this is important. If we're going to be hiring somebody that's going to serve here at the church, you have a direct investment in making that decision, especially somebody that's a pastor. So please, if you get a chance, now we have to leave at 1130 because we have to catch, she has to catch a flight from Toronto back to Winnipeg. And so right after the service, if you'd like to speak with her, speak with her and then please uh, give me your feedback of, of how you feel that this would go. There's another thing I need to speak on and that's uh, to report back. Last week, I had said that uh, we needed to fast from technology and I said that I was going to uh, shut off the internet for three hours in our household. And I did it. I did it. I had everybody bring all of their phones. <laughs> I had everyone bring all their phones, all their laptops, and we brought them to the, the kitchen counter. We turned them all off. I unplugged the internet just in case somebody had some gear somewhere. And so we, we pulled that out, and we did it for three hours. <laughs> okay, so the three hours was great. To be honest, uh, it, was, it, was exactly, it was exactly what we needed. But Brennan made a good point at the end of it. I don't know if you've ever fasted from food before. Um, they tell you that when you're done fasting, you should eat salad. I never eat salad coming off a of fast. I am starving. I eat steak. I want to jump right back into the food that I love, and I probably eat more of it than I would have if I just ate normal food right through the whole time, right? We did the same thing. He mentioned, he said, the minute that bell went off for three hours, we grabbed our phones, we turned it on, and we spent the next three hours on our internet. So there's some kinks we still need to work out here. Um, but we're going to keep doing it. It was a really good time to have that shut down. Um, people probably slept that would have instead been on social media. They actually slept, which was really good. Uh, there was a time when we would just sit and talk. I think part of it is we needed to get bored. We didn't have anything else to do. I couldn't turn my phone, so we turned to each other. And it was a good three hours. I think we're going to also extend it and maybe make it try for four hours next time. We'll see. So the title of the sermon for today is uh, The Right Priorities. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. Let me read it for us. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you challenge us. Lord, we read this text, and as North Americans, as a people that are, in comparison to the rest of the world, financially well off, Lord, it is hard for us sometimes to hear about money and to hear about how we need to engage with it. Lord, we pray that you would work on our hearts. Help us to um, be no longer trapped by money, but rather use money as a tool uh, to bring glory to you and to accomplish the good things you call us to. Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us now. Shape us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you came to my office uh, and uh, spend a little bit of time in my office, you wouldn't have to spend much time. You just have to walk in and realize that I do have a fascination with books. I love books, but it hasn't always been that way. In my early elementary school years, I was obsessed not with books, but with basketball. I, I couldn't get enough of it. I played it all the time. But then in my early teens, maybe 13 or so, I got my first taste of enjoyable reading. That is reading outside of reading for school. As with many other young boys, I got into sci-fi fantasy books. That is any book with a knight or a dragon in it. Those are the kind of books that I loved. 
My parents encouraged my love for reading. They bought those books. They took me to the library. And at the same time, they, they didn't really love the books I was reading, so they were trying to get me to read, like, literature. And uh, they weren't very successful, let's just say that. Uh, uh, they weren't as successful as they would have liked in getting me to read, you know, these uh, higher uh, level academic titles. Finally, though, we did reach a compromise uh, with the adventure books of Robert Louis Stevenson. There is one book that you may have read, probably maybe for school, or you've seen the movie, and it's called Treasure Island. The protagonist and narrator of the story, Jim Hawkins, is a young boy who lives at his parents' inn in 18th century England. After an old sea captain named Billy Bones dies in the inn, Jim and his mother unlock Billy's chest and find a logbook and map inside. Jim realizes that the contents of the sea chest must be valuable. So he takes one of the documents to uh, some of the, his local acquaintances. Excited, they realize this is a map of a huge treasure that was buried by the infamous Captain Flint. It was buried on the, a distant island. They immediately start planning an expedition. They plan this, but they are tricked. They are tricked by one of Flint's former associates... Long John Silver and many of Flint's crew. The ship set sails for Treasure Island with nothing amiss until Jim overhears Silver's plans to mutiny. The rest of the story is an account of the struggle between Jim and Long John Silver, and they wrestle not only against each other, but against the other pirates. The climax of the story comes when Long John Silver uh, leads Jim and the men to the treasure and are shocked to find the treasure is already gone. It isn't until later that the treasure is finally found and taken back to England by Jim and his friends and the pirates and Long John Silver marooned on the island. The story ends on a, on a weird kind of down note, though, because Jim, after coming home, realizes that the joy and happiness he expected to find in finding the treasure was nothing but an illusion. Instead, because of all of the terror and treachery he experienced, he has recurring nightmares that wake him up at night, and it's a condition he has now that no treasure could cure. There's a lot to learn in that book, Treasure Island. And more importantly, a similar teaching that we find in our scripture this morning. We learn that the pursuit in our scripture this morning of earthly treasure ends up an empty hole that never delivers on what it promises, happiness. Furthermore, that the singular pursuit of earthly treasure comes at too high a cost. This morning, it's my hope to reveal the deceptions of these wrong priorities and the blessings that come from following biblical priorities. We begin with the first priority, desiring heavenly treasure, verses 19 to 21. One of the challenges of being a pastor is that God at any moment can call you to another church. You have to have your heart always open and listening to God because God could take a hold of you and he could say, your time here is done and then he can move you somewhere else to a different church. Every time God's called me though, what had to happen was my family had to uproot. We had to pack up and move. I gotta tell you, it's, it's become somewhat normal for us to start collecting cardboard boxes. We start collecting the, it's, uh, it, actually it would probably bring uh, PTSD for Lisa to see cardboard boxes uh, because she knows what that means. And we begin this process of packing. It surprises me every single time that we have moved how those boxes seem to keep multiplying. I keep thinking we're going to be able to do this in a day and it never, it never is completed in a day. It takes many days to pack all this stuff up. There's always something else that seems to need to be packed. And when I, when I go through this process, I realize we've started hoarding again. We've started collecting stuff. It's not like it was all new stuff. It was all old stuff, probably not, something nobody else wanted. 
But somehow, we've collected it all. And when we tried to get it all on the moving truck, we realized, you can look at that picture, there is no, this is a transport truck. There is no room left. They have packed it completely full of stuff. We still had too much. In this first part of the verse, we are told not to lay up or to store up treasures on earth. The challenge is is that storing up treasure on earth is a North American cultural pastime. It's what we do. We don't even know that we're doing it. We live in this, this is the water we swim in. This is, the, this is the context of our world is we are a consumeristic society. In, in a sense, our society is based upon and our wealth is based upon as a country is this continuous need to buy. If all of a sudden everybody in the North America became comfortable with what they had and said, I don't actually need anything else, I'm good. Well, what would happen? The economy would fall apart. So we've got this culture that, that encourages continuous purchasing. We collect things simply for the sake of having the collection. We're not even going to use the stuff. I've met people that collect things and keep them in the packages because that's what a collector does. It'll be worth way more money down the road. So you collect all of these things, but you never take them out. You never use the stuff. That's the kind of storing up of treasure that Jesus is talking about. Did you know that there is actually magazines dedicated to helping people store more stuff? Yes, true. If you went to Indigo, you'd find magazines uh, dedicated to walk-in closets. How to build that new walk-in closet. How to get more storage with a small space. Like, it's this is what they do. And, And then there's other magazines dedicated to like things like these man caves. Man caves are just a place for us to stole our, store all of our stuff. All the stuff our wives don't want in the house. That, but it is a storage. It's a storage entity. I wonder what Jesus would have to say to us. I think he would challenge us. He'd question our, our building bigger garages to store more cars. He would, he would challenge us on the bigger sheds. The bigger shed so I can get more of my collection in there. I think he challenges on having bigger closets to hold more of our stuff, to hold more treasure. Things that fill up storage closets and sheds and shops and garages are stored up treasures. We need to start giving some of that away. We need to start giving some of that away. I don't mean sell it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge everybody a little bit here. As we all of a sudden get into this kind of, again, consumeristic idea of, well, okay, I'll get rid of some of that stuff, but I'm going to sell it. I want to challenge you, give it away. And you'll know when you start giving away to the point when you start releasing uh, treasures, your treasures grasp on your heart when it starts to hurt. So I remember in moving, we always gave stuff away, but we always gave the stuff away we didn't want. That's what you started with. But at the end, it was, we still couldn't get it all in the truck. So I had to go back and start giving stuff away that I didn't want to give away, and it started to hurt. And that's when God was like, this is what it means. This is what you need to do. It's good for you. We need to loosen that grip that stored up treasures have on our hearts. We got to loosen it. And we loosen it by giving stuff away. And secondly, because of verse 19, uh, it says this, moths and rust are going to destroy this stuff anyway. None of the stuff that we hold on to is eternal. This stuff is going to go in the garbage. You know, when when I die, half of the stuff that my kids are going to have to go through, they're going to go, I don't even know what this thing is. And it's going to get what? Thrown in the garbage. It's going to be tossed out this thing that I thought was so important. The moth that Jesus is talking about here is the common clothes moth, which doesn't actually eat clothes. It's the moth babies you actually have to worry about. They've been known to eat wool, cashmere, silk, cotton, linen, fur, feathers, hair, lint, carpets, the bristles of a brush, pet fur, and even dust. 
So you can imagine how Ma is in Jesus' day. So we've got this amazing invention called Tupperware. And Tupperware seals everything out. Nothing can get in. You can seal, but you couldn't seal stuff back then in this way. You couldn't protect it. And so if you left, you know, it was open to the air. There weren't windows. We couldn't seal off houses. So moths were a real problem. If you left clothing just sitting out, moths would get into it, and it would eat the fabric. Well, we know what they knew so well from their experience with things like moths and rust is that everything is temporary. Everything is passing away. Everything. Knowing that everything is temporary, that it helps us, knowing that everything is temporary makes us commiserate with the writer of Ecclesiastes, who said that everything must be as a result of its temporary nature, vanity. Everything we collect, it's a vain pursuit. Be, and all of that vain pursuit, it's, it's meaningless, is what he says, because it's all passing away. While it seems depressing to think about that, it's the truth. It's the truth. It's one we have to remember. And it, it's, it's a, when we remember it, it's a cure for the materialism of our world that tells you you have to buy more, buy more, buy more. Remember, it's all passing away. I'm passing away. That helps us get perspective. It's why Jesus said it's futile to store up anything in this passing world. Rather than, he says, invest in what is permanent. Invest in what is eternal. His investing in vice is simple. Go in, all in, on biblical living and store up treasure in heaven. Now, there is a problem with this idea of storing up treasure in heaven, accumulating treasure in heaven, because people think that what they need to do is all sorts of good stuff to store up and fill up their treasure box in heaven. It's kind of materialism, but kind of just, you know, put into a new spot. It's in, in a new location. They think that if they do one good thing here, I'll have one more jewel in heaven so it's like, it's like they're looking for a one-to-one -one comparison here that I do it, it here, and it has an effect in heaven. But that's not the way it works. And Jesus never said that. Yes, Jesus offers heavenly rewards, but God's gifts are not limited to those who do the most number of good things. Can you imagine if heaven and treasure was a result of a one-to-one -one comparison? Um, you do good, you get more treasure, right? How about the person who dies young? Oh, sorry, yeah, you don't get the amount of time that somebody who lived a nice long life gets to store up treasure. Or somebody that maybe is, you know, can't, comes to a, be, become a believer later in life. You know, they don't become a believer until they're like 90 and they die when they're 91. You know, so they, they have very little treasure in heaven. That's not the way it works. Storing up treasure in heaven means living by the priorities of heaven. It means living in the way that God has called you to. It means living by the priorities that Jesus reveals on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said things like, blessed are the poor. Jesus said things like, blessed are the peacemakers. These are the things that cause treasure to be, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who give, pray, and fast with the right heart. Heavenly treasure comes as a result of pursuing the right thing for the right reason, to bring glory to God. Then Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That is to say, your priorities dictate where, where you store up your treasure, and where you store up your treasure is where your heart is found. Staying focused on heavenly priorities is a struggle because so many things try to take us off track. I want to give you a kind of a tongue-in-cheek de definition of a Christian disciple. A Christian disciple is defined as one who makes a commitment to Christ, and then for the rest of their lives, everything else is trying to pull them off that priority, right? They make a decision for Christ, and right after that, they begin this process of fighting uh, the pull to stop walking in, on the narrow way. They're pulled for and, and the way you get pulled is a change in your priority. What's most important in your life? We are forever being tempted to allow priorities other than God to take first place. Jesus, knowing this, 
teaches two things about treasure. See, it has these two short little teachings, these parables, to show us what it means to live with the right priorities. The first parable reveals the importance of a clear vision or having clear vision. Uh, verse 22 to 23. The text right off the hop, when we read this text, uh, verse 22 to 23, doesn't seem to be in line with basic biology. Never to my knowledge does an eye give light as a lamp does. What I discovered through my research was that the eye of the lamp, is, or the uh, lamp of the eye, is an ancient way of thinking about vision or how vision happened. In the ancient times, they believed that the eye contained a fire or a light inside it that made seeing possible. An eye, just like a flame, was a source of light. It was a sender of rays. It was a sender of light itself, not just a passive receiver. With this revived, vi uh, revi uh, revised vision of uh, a concept of vision, we can understand what Jesus means when he points to the qualities of a healthy eye, an eye that is working properly. First, it's going to send light out into the world to brighten the world. It's going to have an impact on the world, a healthy eye. Around, it's going to allow us to see things. We see things because of the light that comes from our eyes. So our body has something to do with this. Our health has something to do with this, our vision, because it's impacting what we can see. Second, the body itself is illumined itself by the healthy eye. So there's a relationship between the healthy eye and the body. There's a reciprocal relationship between the two. The eye functions well only when the body functions well. The two are together. If the body is not doing the right things, if we're not involved in the right things, if we're doing sinful things, if we follow sinful patterns, if we follow the way of the world, what happens is it affects our vision. It affects our eye. Our eye becomes clouded. You can, uh, it, it diminishes the light inside of it diminishes, and then it doesn't cast out that good light into the world, and it darkens the inner vision of the self. Now, Jesus, for one, had clear, unclouded, spiritual vision of the world and himself. His clear vision allowed him to discern the motivations of the Pharisees. You brood of vipers, he says. He could he could see who they were. Remember the rich young ruler comes to him and what, what must I do? And he had a clear vision of that. The paralytic that needed to be healed that was let down on that mat in the house and he said, uh, your sins are forgiven. He had this clear spiritual vision he could see. That kind of spiritual vision can be ours but it only comes as a result of living biblically. The reason Jesus had so much clarity into the spiritual issues of and people of his day was that he prioritized the will and work of the Father. That's why he had that spiritual vision. His spiritual vision was like a very bright lamp showing him the truth of what was happening in the world. Oppose that with a bad spiritual vision. Bad spiritual vision comes from a body that's dedicated to material gain, hoarding, lack of generosity, living for the self. These wrong priorities cause a disciple's eye to be darkened. And the darker it gets, the less spiritual vision the disciple will have. The darkness is on a sliding scale. You can imagine a dimmer, a dimmer switch, right? Uh, is that if you can imagine, um, if you increase or you decrease uh, the dimmer, you dim it down, and you're increasing your focuses on, well, I said that, totally messed that up. The darkness is on a sliding scale. It's like it's on a dimmer. It decreases as one increasingly focuses on the worldly values and priorities. Let me say that again, just so I get it clear in my own head. This darkness is on a sliding scale. It decreases as one increasingly focuses on worldly values and priorities. At the farthest end, a disciple can become so darkened that when a godly person brings a biblical truth into their lives, they reject it. You've maybe had that happen. You're speaking with another Christian and you share a biblical truth and they reject the truth. And it's a very simple, true thing. And you go, how is it they're not getting this? 
It's a biblical truth. It's because their eyes are darkened. They're rejecting it because they have living a certain lifestyle on the LGBTQ issue. You might go, it's clearly biblical teaching. Why are we not getting this? Why is this not clear? Their eyes have been darkened. And they have to change their lifestyle to start living along God's priorities. And then that will awaken. They'll see it. Ah, there's that truth. This is why Jesus says that one with a dark eye is really dark indeed, truly dark, because they don't just reject the light, they repel the light. Guys, if you want a clear spiritual vision, you must have a singular purpose, to live for God in all things and to do his will. We cannot get distracted, as it's so easy to do, by the accumulation of worldly success. It's so easy to do. I find myself tempted towards it. Have you guys ever been tempted towards wanting to be super successful? Has anybody ever been tempted to that? Has anybody been tempted by wealth? No one. Wow. I got to tell you, okay, I'm glad, I'm glad with you guys. You're going to have to train me here. See, because I did this strange thing. I'm going to reveal a truth. I got onto the stock market. I bought crypto. Whoa. That's a risky proposition. But now, every time, I'm on my phone checking, where are this, where's the market at? How am I doing? How much have I gained? And then how much have I lost? You know, I, I'm looking at that. Now that's very interesting. And I'm thinking, this is an interesting process for me. I'm learning about um, how easy it is to slip into prioritizing this thing is the first thing I check when I wake up. Now I go on to the stock market and check to find out where the stocks are, or am I turning towards the Lord and seeking Him first? Hmm, so easy for us to slip into this other, not a bad thing, I don't think it's a bad thing to invest, I don't think it's a bad thing to look forward to your future and to take care of it, it's wise. Make sure it doesn't become your priority. It's just something that you do. And then you will have that illuminative power, right? You're focused on God. You'll see the truth of things. Next, we come to the second parable of the one master, verse 24. Again, Jesus highlights the importance of having the right priority, having a singular focus. A kind of double-mindedness infects Christians. They believe they can follow the world's ways and live as a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says you can't have two masters. It doesn't work. It's not possible. When he speaks of masters, what is he speaking of? He's speaking of masters and slaves. Masters and slaves. That's the relationship. He says you can't serve two masters. In ancient times, a slave could only have one master. The master was the one who paid for you. Christians get this relationship. Right, Because we talk about it all the time. We say to one another, Jesus paid the price. He paid the price for our sin. He paid the price of death and brought us back from death. But if he paid for us and he is our master, what does that make us? His slave. However, being a slave of Christ is the complete polar opposite of being the slave of another human being. Jesus' purchase doesn't constrain you. Jesus' purchase doesn't chain you. Jesus' purchase of you sets you free. Only a slave of Christ can choose between living for God or living for the self. Christians as slaves of Christ are truly free and can choose holiness over sin, can choose good over evil, can choose God over the self. Those who are slaves of the world, they can't do that. They can only follow sinful ways. But with such freedom comes great responsibility because we have the possibility of living for God. It is now our responsibility to live for God. We have to choose to live with a singular purpose, to follow and serve God in all things. Many believers reject this teaching and it has disastrous results. They end up with divided loyalties, divided hearts. And this is a problem because when you try to harmonize, when you try to bring together living for the world and living for Christ, 
automatically by default it flips and you serve the world it will never flip the other way if you try to bring the two together and they're holding together and this is the world and this is Christ it will flip and Christ will become second place God will become second place you have to choose to serve God with all your heart and then it will be in the right order then you can do all those good things and they're good because they're in the right order Jesus has a name for the kind of this stuff that causes things to flip and that's called mammon have you heard that word that's the old King James version that would have had that in there instead of money it would have said mammon and it's a good word it's a good word because mammon or even money here doesn't just represent cash it represents materialism it represents worldly values in the broadest sense and we have to make sure that we never serve that friends what is your life priority are you like long john silver (laughs) in treasure island you know with a mind and heart that is completely dedicated to accumulating the most amount of treasure you can at all costs would you be willing to compromise your integrity would you be willing to compromise your relationship with christ to become wealthy let, re- let me remind you that if you make treasure on earth your priority, you will either find an empty hole at the end of your life. You will either find an empty hole at the end of your life, no treasure at all, or discover that what you sacrificed to get that treasure was not worth it. I want to challenge you this week to live not as a pirate of this earth, scraping and scrounging and fighting to get ahead but being a disciple of jesus storing up spiritual treasure in heaven as you live for god and the exaltation of his name and his kingdom let us pray holy god i thank you that you are working in our hearts lord it's so easy for us to become materialistic Lord, we want to be wise with our resources. We want to be good stewards. We want to do the right thing. We want to bring glory to your name with all that we have. So, Lord, I just pray that every person here in the congregation, myself included, Lord, would never allow mammon, money, material things to ever get a hold of our hearts that we would never uh, put that up as the most important thing. Lord, and as a gift that you give to us where wealth comes our way, Lord, I just pray that we would be good stewards of that wealth, that we would pass it out to others, that we would use it for the building up of our families. Lord, that we would use it for the growth of your kingdom. Lord, that we would seek your priorities even in the use of these wonderful resources you've given us. Lord, guide us and bless us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Christ grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forever to the day of eternity. Amen. 